Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Diana Daly. I'm the president of uh, Eastern North Carolina Irish Society. Um, but I'm not actually here to talk, talk about myself, but I'm here to talk about Carol Warner. Um, she is the owner of Draycott Gardens in Upper, Upper Co, um, Upper Co, Maryland, uh, which is a small web-based mail, mail order business specializing in beardless irises. She is a, Mar um, a Maryland native and a graduate of the University of Maryland. Um, her 39-year relationship with irises began in 1976 when she joined the Francis Scott Key Iris Society. Um, she's also an American um, Iris uh, Society Emeritus Judge and past president of both the Society of Siberian Iris and the Society for Japanese Iris. Her gardens have been featured in Good Housekeeping, Chesapeake Home, Baltimore Magazine, Arrive Magazine, and also HGTV, A Gardener's Diary. Um, her program today will actually focus on different types of irises that, um, so that you can produce a longer season of bloom for your garden. Um, and most of the pictures are, are taken from her garden, which is absolutely lovely. Um, I don't know how often you actually open it up to, to the public, um, but if you ever have a chance to visit her, it's fabulous. So at that, Carol Warner. Very nice to be down here in North Carolina. It's warmer than it is up at home right now. That cold front didn't quite get to you, uh, but it got to us. Um, before I even start the program, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the irises that are up here. Um, I'm sure most of you saw them as you came in, and they are re-blooming bearded irises, uh, or called remontants. Um, not all irises bloom spring and fall, but certain ones do, and these are those certain ones. And um, they are all bearded irises, and I'm going to talk about the beard and different things, but uh, hopefully you can see it on some of these too. There are no re-blooming beardless irises. Mm. The, re the irises, the beardless irises that re-bloom, re-bloom right after they finish bloom. And in other words, they just kind of keep on going. They're called repeat blooms. But there's no beardless ones that bloom at this time of the year. Or does anybody have any questions about the re-bloom? To get them to re-bloom, it's nice to keep dividing them. The re-bloomers seem to like to, to be divided. And they also like to um, get a little extra water in the summer, especially if it's dry. And that'll help your re-bloom. Yes? Where can you purchase these re-blooming? <laughs> oh, from the Iris Society uh. where they have their sales. <laughs> Um, and if you can't make that, there are nurseries, and there's one in uh, Virginia, uh, Winterberry Nursery, that specializes in re-bloomers. Uh, that's another good source for them. Okay, so after we talk about those, then we'll start, oh, that's right, I stay up here. <laughs> I usually go back there. Um, we're going to... Uh, my topic was using irises in the landscape, and that got changed to all kinds of different topics. I forget what Diana asked me what I was going to talk on yesterday. No, that's not it, but we'll, um, I'll talk on a lot of different things along with this. So um, this uh, particular slide was taken in my garden, um, and uh, my garden has a lot of peonies and a lot of viruses and a lot of other different perennials. Okay, so this is a bearded iris. You sure can't miss the beard. Um, that orange beard uh, tells you just about everything you need to know about this iris. It wants to be in a dry, sunny location. You move it in the middle of the summer when it's hot. Um, irises produce their flowers and they take a rest for about six weeks and then they drop all their old roots and they start to grow new roots. Perfect time to move it. The beard is just a landing spot for the pollinators. You know, we only get flowers just because they want to produce seeds. So they want to attract a pollinator to come in there 
land on that beard, and walk in and brush pollen on uh, the sticky, stigmatic lip in there. Um, if I gave you a piece of this iris, if I gave you a rhizome, it would be the same in everybody's garden. It would bloom about the same time. If the top flower opened first, <coughs> it would open first in your garden, in your garden. Um, so that way you all would get this particular iris. If I got seed from this, who knows what you'd get. You'd get all kinds of different children. So what does a beardless iris do? It has a signal area right in through here with even some lines on the landing strip to tell the, the pollinator, oh, I want you to walk right in here. And many, many of them have a brighter color. A lot of them are yellow because yellow is the easiest thing for the bee to see. So um, the, the beardless irises, of course, don't have your fuzzy thing. And um, they are divided either spring or fall. I much prefer fall. And when you um, dig them and divide them, if you're going to hold them for a little while, you have to put the roots in some water. They can't dry out. If the roots all dry up, they're dead. Uh, a bearded iris, you can dig it up in July, throw it in the corner of your garage, come back and find it in September or October, stick it in the ground, it'll be fine. Just as long as you didn't keep it wet, as long as it was dry, it would stay. I've even had them the next year where they spent the winter in the barn and planted the next year, and they still make it. So, but the beardless have to be kept wet, and they um, are usually done spring and fall. So here's a bearded iris, and you can see the irises uh, are named after the goddess of the rainbow. They come in most every single color except uh, fire engine red. And we have a hybridizer uh, from Winterberry Gardens who's still, who's working on trying to get really red ones. And last spring, he said, come see my best red. Well, a fire engine <laughs> painted that color, it wasn't going to cut it. Uh, it was still a little maroon. It had some purple in there, uh, but we're, we're coming. So, an iris blooms on a stalk, and you have a, a flower that's spent, gone past, and if this were in my garden, which it is, mm -hmm. I should have been out there, instead of taking a picture, I should have been out there taking this off and taking that off. And normally I would, but I took this picture on purpose. Um, I take all those off and because it just makes your garden look better. As they bloom down the stalk, they should have, well, they, they say seven buds. An iris should have seven buds, but there are some out there without seven buds. Um, hybridizers don't always pay attention to that. But uh, it should have seven buds and open successively and be in bloom about two weeks in the garden. So I would take that off. When all of these are finished, I go down to the bottom of the clump, right where the stalk meets the ground, and I push the stalk toward the center of the clump, and it will break off right at the rhizome. 99% uh, of them will break off. About 1% you have to cut it off. I don't know what makes them, you know, just a little rubbery or something, but 99% uh, will break off. And I do that because it takes a lot of plant energy to make seeds. And these are going to try to make seeds. If a bee has come in there and fertilized it, they're going to try to make seed. And you don't want seeds. They're all going to... A lot of them are going to be ugly, a high percentage are going to be purple. So you want what you bought and what you planted. So take all the seeds and stalks off. So when if, if I took the falls off of these, and that's what this picture did, I took the falls off of the iris and, 
and the iris has it always parts in three. It has three standards that stand up and three balls <coughs> that fall down. Can't be easier than that. So uh, I take the balls off a of bee can't land, and then the bee um, to hybridize to make a new iris. You would just take tweezers or your fingernails or something, pinch this off, take this pollen right here over and put it on the white iris that you want to hybridize with or, <coughs> or whatever other color you want to hybridize with and um, that you would put it right up here on the stigmatic lip which is already sticky and uh, you would tag your cross with what you crossed and produce a new iris. Um, and there you would have all kinds of different things if you crossed a yellow and a white. Oops, this way. And no, wrong button. All right, my slides are pretty much in order of how the irises bloom and the order and they bloom in the year. So my first irises to come up are the iris reticulata. They're in a bulb, come from a bulb, and you just buy them where you buy tulips and daffodils. Um, the little blue ones, uh, Harmony and a couple others, are usually very reliable, come back year after year. There are little yellow ones called Dan Fortii, and they're not so reliable. Uh, they're kind of like tulips. You plant six, and six come up the first year, and three the next year, and then maybe one the next, and then you don't see them anymore. But the little reticulata increase, and um, they do very nicely. And you can even grow them in a shady location because they bloom, their greens are done before leaves come on a tree. So um, you can grow them in, in a sunny spot or in a, um, in a shady spot. And these are over by my woods, and I use pine needles a lot for my mulch because I live on a pretty steep hill and barn mulch will wash off if we get a great big rain, but the pine needles just knit together and don't move anywhere. You can see water goes right through them. A lot of people tell me, um, well, what do you, don't you worry about the acid? And I have acid soil already. I don't think they make it much more acid, but if they do, and I use it around peonies that like a more alkaline soil, so I just put a handful of lime on top of the peony in the fall and kind of let it soak in through the winter with the rain and the snow and they're fine most with pine needles. This is a little native iris. This is Iris cristata. Um, comes in purple and kind of blue and white. Um, it runs. It blooms very early. It's only about six or eight inches um, high. Again, it, it kind of likes a wooded area. Um, this, was, this slide was taken at Mount Cuba in uh, Delaware. Um, but it's a lovely little uh, kind of a ground cover. And then the first bearded irises to bloom, well, are miniature dwarfs then come the standard dwarfs. I don't do well with growing the miniature dwarfs. They like a colder area, and I would think you probably would not do too well e either with them. The miniature dwarfs do not like to get hot in the summer, and I know Raleigh could get hot. So um, the, the best <coughs> ones for me are the standard dwarfs, and they vary between eight and 15 inches in height. They um, they increase pretty rapidly sometimes, but you can see they stay in a nice clump and um, they, they're a great plant to put like at the edge of your bed, a perennial bed, and uh, after they bloom, the, you, know, you just still have that nice foliage. And then um, this is another uh, dwarf that gets a little taller. Um, exotic eyes is what that is. And then this is an intermediate iris. It's a cross between the tall and the short. So it's going to bloom intermediate time. This is one called I Hear Music. And these can be up to 27 inches in height. Um, and 
Uh, they usually have uh, maybe four or five buds on a stalk. Um, and again, they're, they're great for the front of your uh, border or a little farther back in. I have this one growing in my rock garden. Um, because it stays small, it can be in a rock garden. Uh, the dwarf uh, was in a rock garden too. Oops, sorry, two times. All right, this is what's called a miniature tall bearded <coughs> iris. And a miniature tall bearded iris has lots of blooms on a stalk. The stalks are very thin. Sometimes they're called a table iris because you can use them in bouquets on your table. They're a lot easier to use on a bouquet than these guys up here with their tall stalks. Um, and they also, um, they have multitude of blooms on them. This particular one is one called Sari's Dance, and it just won the top award for this class of irises this year. And uh, the hybridizer was uh, uh, the guy who runs Winterberry Iris uh, Farm, and uh, so it was in Region 4, which is our, our area here. So we're real proud of having an award winner hybridized here. This is a real old historic iris. It's one called Laurelay. Um, I have an awful lot of brand new irises, but you know what? I'm never going to part with Laurelay. There's a couple others uh, like Wabash and Helen Collingwood that are purple and white, and they just they grow anywhere. You don't even have to divide them. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, they just are super duper garden plants. And I just kind of love the, the color. Um, they've got open standards. You know, they're not all domed up and look fancy. But they, they're just a wonderful, wonderful landscape plant. <coughs> and then I think that this might be butter pecan. Um, which is an intermediate, and it, I lost the name for this. I got it at the Iris Society sale. I lost the name, it wasn't written on it, and I forgot it when I got home. And I don't have anything hardly in my garden that I don't know the name of, but here's another one I'm not ever gonna get rid of. <laughs> Just because of, it blooms early, it's, it's like the only one out at that time. It's this huge splash of color, and I hate yellow, but I love this iris in, in my garden. Um, and it, it multiplies nicely. So some of these intermediates and these smaller ones are nice, especially, um, you know, these never fall over like the big ones. I have too many irises to be out there with a stake, you know, putting bamboo in and tying stuff around. That, that's for somebody else. That's not for me. I, I don't have time for that. So these small ones, you don't ever have to think about that. This is, I think, Iris japonica. And that is not hardy for us, but this in Maryland. But this particular one is, I got it as Iris formasana. But uh, the books all say that Iris formasana doesn't exist. It's, you know, it's extinct or whatever. Um, but. I think this is a form of Irish Japonica. It Carol? blooms early. Carol? Yes. It grows extremely well in the Raleigh area. It, and it does a spread by like runners. Yes. yes. This one, this one, you can grow it in the shade and it spreads by runners. It'll even spread out into your grass and stuff. <laughs> but if you pick one of these stalks here, and you put it in a little bud vase, it's just an instant arrangement. It's so cute. And for me, I sell these sometimes at a big uh, thing at Ladue Gardens near me. And if I take one of those in a, in, a, in a vase, I can sell out those plants in an instant. Five dollars a piece and, and I can sell, you know, a hundred of them. Everybody walks by and wants it. And, but it'll take over the garden, and I've had to take some of it out now forcibly because it, it does spread. 
but you have the other different kinds of japonica down here that don't spread so bad. I've seen a lot of them. But it's a great little thing. Um, sometimes it's foliage. If you had a bad winter, it's foliage. It looks a little ratty at the end of the year or at the beginning of the re year. Now, this is a versicolor here in the front. Um, it's, uh, that's the native iris from like Maryland and Northern Virginia north. The native iris is iris, oh, yeah, versicolor. And uh, down here, your native iris should be iris virginica. Very difficult to tell them apart, especially by the flower. You, there's something about the seed, whether it is shiny or it's not shiny, it's the only way you can tell them apart. But this is iris versicolor. They're nice because they grow in water or they grow in dry land. They have a lot of small flowers, little graceful flowers on a tall stalk. Um, let's see. So here's a close-up of that particular one. Um, just a, a charming little thing for the garden. Great little landscape plant. Increases nicely. Here's another um, iris, first color. And actually, if you were going to find them in the wild, you would probably find them in this purple or bluish kind of color rather than in the, the white form. There's a darker one down here, then that's probably a hybrid of some type. Hear me. Um, this, this little um, iris is Iris tectorum, the Japanese roof iris. It, doesn't grow and it didn't come from Japan and it doesn't grow on roofs. That's its common name. It's Iris tectorum. And it comes in the purple form and the uh, white form. If you look um, on some of these, see there's like what looks like a beard. It's not. It's hard. It's not fuzzy. It's a crested iris. And um, that the uh, Cristata was also a crested iris. They're the only two that I have pictures of. So this is in my woods, along the edge of the woods, and you've got Jack in the Pulpit and Bleeding Heart back here, and you're on underneath of a rhododendron here. So Tectorum is one of the irises that will take some shade, and it actually prefers <coughs> some shade, and I'm sure farther south you go, the more shade it would like. Here it is uh, next to my pond. And there again, the irises that are in the pond are Iris lavagata, another beardless iris, or lavagata, some people say, but I say lavagata. Um, it comes in a variegated form that you can see here in the foreground, and then um, some others that are um, just have the green foliage. Um, they bloom earlier than your tall beardeds. You can see they're blooming with the rhododendrons in the background here. Um, they can stay in the water all year. You don't have to pull them out. They can freeze. That pond will freeze solid. Um, and they can stay in there uh, for the winter uh, and be just fine. I love the variegated one. I've tried growing it in um, plain soil in my garden. It does not do too well. Uh, just doesn't like the dry conditions. I have a bog, a peat moss bog, and it'll, it'll do okay in there, but it sure does its best in the water in the pot. Um, I don't know why that's there, just to show you the fish in the pond, I guess. <laughs> And here's another uh, picture of the lavago, the variegated one. And the uh, guy in the back here, I think I have another picture of that. That's an iris sudata. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, because usually they bloom a little later as this picture of lavagatas are all done. Oh, here's a named lavagata from a hybridizer out in Oregon. And ghost is part of its name, Lakeside Ghost. Um, it's a nice uh, lavagata. I have that one growing in the just ordinary soil and it does fine. 
Um, I think most of them will, but that variegated one is a little trouble in regular soil. My garden club did a rain garden for a public park near us. Um, there's playing fields all in the back of here where they play baseball and soccer and all that kind of stuff. And when it's heavy, heavy rain, it drains down through this area and the Jones Falls, which runs into the Chesapeake Bay, is right here, um, probably 10, 15 feet from our rain garden. And this captures all of that water when it rains hard. Is it raining hard now? I'm <laughs> thinking. <laughs> so it captures the water. And we have in here iris versicolor and the Sudata iris and Japanese iris. Um, and it's great. Irises get borers, and you get them down here in this area too. Um, it's like a little worm that eats the rhizome out. They hatch in the spring, and they eat their way down, and then they eat that rhizome out. It's like eating the potato out, leaving the, the skin, and your leaves fall over. Well, first colors are a host for iris borers, and I thought, oh, we're going to have a mess. And we can't spray this. You can't put any spray in there. But you know what? This floods enough that the irises of uh, the boars can't swim. And if the, the water stays in there for a day or two, they die. We'd never had a boar or anything in this rain garden. Here it is as the, they're getting bigger. And they had an art show in the, in the uh, park there, too. <coughs> So um, there's a few other things in there like Joe Pie weed and uh, a couple other um, things that like a moist area. And this is in the late summer or early summer when it's dry. Here again are some Lavagata um, growing in a pond out in Oregon. And here in the water, just, just to show you some different things that grow in the water, this is a a grouping of Japanese irises um, in, a, in a pond at a botanic garden here. Now, these are iris pseudochorus, the yellow water iris, some kind of, sometimes called the yellow flag iris, and these are extremely invasive, and they are on the invasive plant list. You cannot sell these, I don't think, in any state. Um, in certain states, Oregon and Washington State are leading the charge on this. And if you are growing them, you can be made to take them out. Because they not only spread like crazy, but they produce a lot of seed. And the seed floats. And anywhere your water is a foot or less in that <coughs> the root can come up. And uh, where I live, the Northeast River runs down, joins up with the Susquehanna into the Chesapeake Bay, and the Northeast River is just becoming choked with them. Mm. A lot of the wetlands are being choked. I saw a uh, lake in Colorado when I was out there. But the, there was nothing in the lake but these pseudoporous. I think the Department of Agriculture is way behind on this, making these rulings that they can't be sold. And um, so they're an invasive plant. If you have a nice little pond in your backyard that the seeds are not going to get into the bay or some other nice river near you, you can grow them and they're pretty. The foliage is nice, uh, shiny green. The only problem might be is if you try to get them out, you need kind of a backhoe to get them out. <laughs> they can really be tough. Um, so that is virus pseudochorus and one you should not be growing in your landscape. Now, how about some combinations with the irises? Um, I said that I grow an awful lot of peonies. So I probably have maybe 150 different kinds of peonies in my yard. And here, you, you can't get this color pink 
or red, whatever you want to call that, irises don't come in that color. So I like to plant the purples and the whites and the blues with the peonies. So there, um, the iris to the left is called walking on air, and the um, peony is sword dance. And here um, are some, again, bearded irises. Uh, this is one called I'm Back. It bloom, reblooms in Oregon, but it never rebloomed for me. Um, and it doesn't rebloom for Jenny and Don either. So um, we're just in the wrong um, class here. The peony, uh, we're going to digress a little bit here. The peony is what's called an Eto hybrid. It's a cross between the herbaceous peony that dies all the way down and the tree peonies that are woody. Um, and they haven't been around for a long time. Um, maybe starting in the 1960s or so, and they were very expensive. And they still can be fairly expensive, maybe $40 or $50. Uh, and, but Home Depot and some of those kind of places now sell them. Um, and you get the colors from the tree peony. You get yellows, you get kind of oranges, you get blends, color, blended colors. And they're wonderful landscape plants. They die all the way down to the ground. You cut them off at the ground when, you know, after a few couple frosts or something. For me, you know, late October, November is the time to cut them all down. And then the next year they come up and they have nice strong stems. They don't fall over. And they have these wonderful colors. So that's an Ito hybrid peony. Do you know the name of that one? Yes, it was Canary Brilliance. <laughs> um, this is a gazebo up at the top of my property and just showing you the, that a clump of iris. They, you know, they like to uh, form a clump. Uh, some people don't want them to do that, uh, but I like to have a nice big clump. And if you start with three or five, Rhizomes, it only takes you a year or two to get a nice clump <coughs> like this. When the clump gets too thick and you look down and you see all the rhizomes over top of each other and they're not blooming too well, it's time to dig them up, find a new home for them in a sunny location. And this is just a picture from my rock garden that is showing you a Siberian iris here, a little dwarf one, a intermediate bearded iris here, and then this is Iris graminea. It always blooms down in its foliage. The graminea is the grassy iris, it's really a spurrier iris. And, um, but again, if you cut a little stalk of this, it's kind of branched and put it in a bud vase or two of them or three of them in a bud vase, it's instant arrangement. Plus, if you're going to enter an Irish show, it's a whole lot easier to take that in your car than it is one of these big things, because these fall over in the car and shut the door and everything <laughs> else. Uh, there's that ink patterns again and the same uh, yellow peony in the background. Um, in one of my front gardens, that's a real tree peony there. The yellow one is Roman gold, and um, this purple iris here in the front um, is, uh, starts with an M, I uh, can't remember right now, but it's a real old one. But I like the purples and the yellows together. And the peony is chocolate soldier. The pink mm -hmm. iris is vanity. For us in Maryland, vanity is our best pink iris to grow. I don't know how it does down here. I would assume it, it does well. It's one from the 60s, but it's still an excellent iris to grow in the landscape <coughs> um, because it, it, it just is an easy plant to grow. Some of the pink ones and the brown ones are a little harder to grow. Seems like the purple ones, the whites, and the yellows will grow most anywhere. But when you decide you want a couple brown ones in there, or some of the pink ones, it's a little more trouble. They, they want exactly what they want. 
here I've used the white irises, one of the first irises I ever got. It's called bridal wreath and it comes early and it keeps on blooming forever with the red peony laddie. Just another shot of that same thing from the other side showing you how many buds and all that particular one puts on and it seems to keep on putting up extra stalks. Another color combination from the back of the garden. Um, we have uh, Maui, no, Moonlight. Moonlight, I'm having a terrible time with my memory of the names right now. Um, this is Rainy River in the front and that's Magical Moonlight in the back, one of Shriner's irises. But again, just the yellow and the purple. Up here at the gazebo with the purple irises, the, the, the uh, Siberian irises and peonies still mixed together there. And uh, this just, I, I don't have any idea what this iris is. It could have, it's an older iris, I can tell by the form, but it may have been this person. This was a tour I was on, and um, <clears throat> I don't know whose home it is. It was somewhere around Maryland. And um, it could have been their mother's iris or their grandmother's iris. Sometimes they're the best ones to have because they're sentimental to you and they also, um, the older ones seem to never get any problems. They don't get much leaf spot, they don't rot. Um, the newer ones that are hybridized sometimes can be a little bit finicky. This is uh, one that comes fairly early for me, it's Duncan's Smiling Eyes. And this is one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, but this is a, one of my favorites. And this is Sky and Sun. Um, just I just love the the blue color and that yellow beard just just makes it. And it, for me, it's a real good grower too. It's just a picture of the front bed coming up my driveway, and you can see there's a lot of different things within there. So bearded irises like a dry location, beardless irises like a moist location with a little mulch. So what I do is if I'm going to um, plant, let's say these two here in front, this Siberian and this bearded iris, I dig a little hole here and I throw the dirt up there and I plant the bearded irises on the hill and put the beardless irises down in a little dip where they get more water when it rains and that way you can combine them. The same thing was done here. If, if, I don't ha if I'm not planting the two things at the same time, I just mound up, I just take a shovel full of dirt from here and put it there and plant the bearded irises a little high and that way everybody gets the same and I mulch around the beardless one and I don't ever mulch on top of the bearded one. You like to be able to see the rhizomes on a bearded iris. When you look down in there, you should be able to see the rhizome that it's growing from. Another combination with Siberians and bearded iris. Lovely color purple one, um, Celtic heart. This is Shriner's Garden out in Oregon. And this is their display garden. And I just love it because they combine so many things. You think if I'm gonna to go to Shriner's, I'm just gonna see rows of irises, which you do across the uh, Highway 5. You see row after row and just huge blocks of yellow and a block of blue and a block of purple. I mean, you know, 2,000 rhizomes in lines in each little block. But in their display garden, they use all kinds of things, especially the lupins and uh, the delphiniums and, and a lot of other things. There's things in there that you hardly see that are gonna bloom later. There's even some allium mixed in here. And a lot of times there's people painting this picture and you know, if you just, squared up that or something, cut out all the rest, it would be a gorgeous watercolor. 
That's what their garden reminds me of, is just a watercolor paint thing. So, after the bearded irises are bloom, well, while the beardeds are blooming, the Siberians <clears throat> begin to bloom. They bloom just a little bit later than the bearded. And so here's your foliage on um, the Siberian. It's very grassy. Here's another one that it arches just a little more than this one. This one's Tropic Night, and it would grow for you grand down here. Tropic Night and Caesar's Brother. Um, you can just drop them most anywhere, and the farther south you go, it's fine. Some of the Siberians like a cold winter. They all need some cold, but um, they do better in a colder area than they seem to do down here, at least from what I've seen. But Tropic Night and Caesar's Brother will certainly do super well down here. Um, I love these because uh, particularly this one, has these red space that the flowers come out of. It's almost as pretty when it's in bud as it is when it's blooming. And then when it's finished blooming, I do the same thing. I pull the stalks toward the center of the clump, and they come off right at the base, and you have a beautiful short ornamental grass for the rest of the season. And then in the fall, that ornamental grass turns a brilliant yellow. Wonderful landscape plant. <clears throat> there, oh, there you can see the, the red space better on that particular shot. I forget what I have in here. Um, this is just uh, another one of those Ito hybrid peonies with a um, purple Siberian. This happens to be Twelfth Night, which is one of mine. I have six iris introductions and one penny, and that particular one is my mine. Advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this is in another garden in Maryland, not in my garden, but again, using the alliums, the peonies, and the Siberian irises in a wonderfully landscaped garden. That's her front walk. With there's a there is an iris peeking out over here. Um, and I think she had some dwarfs and different things down here. Um, that's a pretty well-known garden in our area. Here again, some um, Siberians at the fence going into her garden. Um, this particular Siberian is one that blooms very early. And it's across, um, I don't know, you, uh, Chris talked about getting plants from North Vietnam. Um, some of our plant collectors have gone over to China and found a new Siberian, which is called Typifolia or Typifolia, however you want to pronounce it. And our hybridizers have crossed with it, and you get these tall stalks, you get early flowers, some of them are just lovely. And, but you get kind of stringy foliage from the, the Typifolia, and late in the season, that foliage falls over, which certainly is a fault. But they come early, and some of them are very graceful and pretty. Um, this particular one is Swans in Flight, and Swans in Flight won the top medal for irises is the Dykes medal. It has never been won by a beardless iris until mm -hmm. last year, and Swans in Flight won that top medal for uh, an iris. So all of us beardless friend, uh, fans are just, you know, flying high. It's a great landscape plant. It really grows well. Some of them do come in the yellow colors, and we're getting more and more of um, yellow colors. The old one used to be butter and sugar, which was yellow and white, but it faded out, and it's a pain in the neck to grow. But some of these newer ones are um, doing much, much better. Um, I think this one is Sunfisher. So, another advertisement. Next May, our um, Iris Society in Maryland is hosting the Siberian Iris Society and the Species Iris Society at a convention. Yeah. And we were sent 140-some different guests uh, 
for this convention. And so some of these are seedlings that have not even been named yet. So I just wanted to show you some of the newer colors that these Siberians are coming in. Um, there's one from a hybridizer out in Michigan. Uh, I just fell in love when this started. This is the first year it bloomed. I had two little stalks. Now I have a really nice clump. I can't wait for people to come see it next year. It's stunning with the yellow and the purple and the blue in the middle. Um, some of these, if they have weird colors, can get a little muddy. But this one's not muddy at all. And it is named Art and Bloom. Um, I think this one's called Fiddles on Fire. I just have the number here, but I think that was introduced this year. And look at that wonderful signal and how red it is and how round it is and ruffled. A real super dark one with an incredible yellow rim around it and then, you know, your light style arms in the middle. Another one where the the signal almost goes to the edge of the, the fall. Um, I'm pretty sure that has a name, but I can't remember what it is. It just, it just got named this year. <coughs> now here's one of those that's um, kind of a brown color. This one I think is fine. If it gets too much brown and green, then I think they're a little muddy, but this particular one is pretty nice. Um, there's one called Drink Your Tea, um, which is very similar that's been named. This one has not been named. And these couple of these uh, strange colors come from Joe Pye Weed Garden up in Massachusetts. Um, this is a double. You've got six falls on this particular one. And they're kind of nice, a um, little different. Uh, that's again the hybridizer out in Michigan. Okay, so that's the end of that advertisement for those, those new Siberians that, that we're growing for next year. Um, this is oh well, we're still with a Siberian iris and poppies in the garden. Again, a nice color combination with the white and the orange. These are spurrier irises. Um, spurrier irises look like the Dutch iris, like you get in the florist shop. They look very much like that. Um, they're usually about three to four feet tall, and then they have multiple blooms up and down the stems. They come in a lot of different colors, so the blues, the purples, the yellows, almost red. Um, the foliage comes up early in the spring on those, and then the flowers, and then the foliage dies through the summer, so they might be good in the south here. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but the foliage dies down. They, they do really well in Arizona and the dry areas. You might get too much rain in the summer for them, but if you had a dry summer, they'd love it. So they go dormant, and then the foliage comes up in the fall again and stays through the winter. So they're just another kind of beardless iris that uh, is a good landscape plant depending on where you live, and, and there's another uh, picture of them. And this was taken in Oregon uh, with uh, a different color shown there. Then I talked about the Sudata irises, and that's what this is right here. Um, the uh, couple hybridizers have learned how to cross the invasive Pseudochorus iris with the Japanese iris, the iris in Sada. And when you cross them, they, you get the colors from um, the pseudochorus. You get the yellows. You also get purples and, and, and a lot of patterns and all from the Japanese iris. But it's a sterile plant. It does not make any seed. So hopefully, as we get more and more of these, they will replace the pseudochorus. Um, nursery centers that sell it, you know, for ponds and all, will start to sell the, the sterile um, type of iris, water iris. They can um, be planted in a pond that freezes. Um, they can be in a pot that freezes. Um, Japanese iris cannot freeze in the water. 
they can, you know, they have to be, if they're in a pot in a pond, you have to lift the pot out, and maybe bury it in the, the garden, just take a shovel full of soil, dig it out, just stick the pot in through the soil on top and done. But um, they can't freeze, but these particular ones can freeze in the, um, in the water, water. There's just a close up of them. They all have the signal area, and a lot of them have a real bright halo of different colors, reds and purples and all. Um, and it's just a way, again, to attract the pollinator, but they have a beautiful signal area in them. Here's another one. This one's called Yari. And you can see the combination of colors um, coming some from the, really you have, what you have here is a yellow background overlaid with this red veining. And then you have your red signal up in here, your, your eyelash pattern there. And from a distance, it looks peach. But when you examine it, it's a yellow <coughs> background with the red veining on it. And you can see they, they have nice stalks. A lot of them have real nice branching, usually three or so branches, sometimes four. And they produce a lot of buds. Some of them can produce up to 14 to 20 buds on a plant because they just keep making more buds. When you think this top was finished, sometimes there's three in the top and it'll force a fourth. So um, I think eventually they'll be your thing for water gardens. Just got to get enough of them. This is one called Okagami um, and it's a near white. It's kind of got a little lavender to it and it just won the Randolph Perry medal this year for the top uh, species cross iris. And I have it growing in a pot in my pond. Now these are Japanese iris. Um, this looks very much like a species form of um, a Japanese iris with the three falls to it um, and the three little tiny standards. They have really nice leaves. Again, the foliage is great. If you take the stalks off, the foliage is great. And the foliage always has a midrib in it. Um, you can kind of see it in here. It gives it a lot of strength. And people will ask me, Do you, is this a Siberian or is this a Japanese? The Siberian leaf is flat, and the Japanese iris leaf has a midrib in it. Here's in a uh, different garden that I was on, went to tour with the uh, Japanese irises in amongst some a lot of roses, and they bloom late when roses do. Um, some of the irises have a variegated foliage. This is unfortunately a variegated pseudochorus, and it does grow like a pseudochorus and, mm -hmm. and uh, produces seeds, so it's not a good thing to have, but it is pretty to have variegated foliage. These sudatas, when they first come up, have this color foliage. Hmm. Very pretty in the garden, and there's a couple of them that retain <coughs> this yellow-green foliage. I grow one of them that remains very low uh, in my garden just for the foliage. So here's some more Japanese iris. This particular one has six falls, no standards. Each one has a signal on it, so that's um, termed a double or a six fall variety. I can't tell from here if that's three big falls or six falls. I think that's three big falls and this is six fall variety here. They bloom late now. Oops. They bloom late so there it is with a climbing rose. Um, and so it's the whole month after the tall bearded. So that way I have a long time of bloom with the irises in my garden. There's just kind of an overshot of some of the Siberian, I mean the Japanese in bloom. These are Sudatas back in here, this yellow and that kind of funny color there. The Japanese irises come in white and purple and then everything in between, a lot of dotting, a lot of the white on the dark background is called a ray. If they're, um, if they're light with lines on them, they're called veins. Here's one that has the, the style arms in the middle. They're dark purple. 
um, very pretty uh, particular one. That one's really called Center of Attention. It's one of my favorite ones, too. And <clears throat> this is an iris in, in Hawaii. Uh, for us, we would have to grow it in a, uh, in a greenhouse or something like that. It's very tropical. But when I was in Hawaii, I was thrilled to see some uh, irises over there. Um, and I thought this was a particularly pretty one uh, blooming over there. And they, they, use it, they use clumps of those along a lot of the roads over there. And I have a lot of visitors to my garden. <laughs> These particular guys, um, I put this in because irises are not eaten by these fellows. They may take a bite. If you plant something new and they're not used to it, they may come and bite it and pull it out, drop it, but then you can stick it back in. They also do not eat peonies, but they eat practically everything else I have. Um, my azaleas, they, my daylilies, uh, they just love to eat my daylilies, and the hosta. Um, so uh, that's another big benefit of irises in your landscape because the deer don't like them. Okay, I think that's it for the slides. Um, does anybody have some questions you want to ask? Benita Harold, do you still have available or easily available any close-ups of the stars? Uh, so yeah. That they can get a better idea of what the bloom looks like. I do. They, they are beautiful in the landscape, but it's it's such a new iris that most of these folks have not ever seen. I uh, just gave a talk on them yesterday, so if Dave, you want to slip the thumb drive into that um, machine or Chris. <laughs> Any other questions while they, they put that in? Yes? You didn't mention the iris pallida or the iris root. Okay, right. And the reason being it doesn't do too well for me, but iris uh, pallida, um, it's an older form. It's a bearded iris. The so flowers are small, and it comes in white, and it comes in purple. And it is a good landscape plant. I didn't mention it because I don't have it in my garden, but maybe I need to find a garden, take a picture of it, so I do. Yes. I, I have the variegated form, which is a good stabilized uh -huh. attraction. And good. the flowers just are a plus at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're not the prettiest flowers in the world, but they're they're nice. They're very acceptable. Right. The and the variegated foliage is great. Okay, do these top one, the pseudata talk right there. He's going to put it, I guess, on his lock, on his laptop. Yeah. Or we could have run it off the phone drive. Okay. Some other questions? Yes. When you prepare the soil, what are we trying to do with the soil to get the best growth? You know what? Bearded iris is like the poorest you can get. Mine, like I have nothing but clay and rock, and they. They want poor soil. The more compost and that kind of thing you put in holds moisture, and they'll rot. And the, the more fertilizer, if you fertilize them way too much, the rot. Um, so bearded irises don't do much with your soil. Uh, beardless irises would like a little more japanese irises would like a little more fertilizer if possible they're heavy feeders and like a little more water um, but and they'll they'll take the composty type soil and a nice mulch where the bearded irises are not going to want mulch and they're not going to want real fertile soil can you mention lime and japanese real quick oh well Japanese and Siberian iris is like a acid soil, and Japanese especially like an acid soil. And um, I told them the other day, you can't even mention the word lime around them. They don't like that. Um, well, I, I put lime on a peony, but I put it right on the peony. I don't really let it get over onto the, the Siberians or the Japanese. Yes? Where would the tectorum or crested ball in that? 
they, they're pretty resilient. They, they'll take a lot of shade and they'll take some sun. Um, they're more like a bearded iris in that they'll grow in a dry location. And the thing with tectorum, they keep making their rhizomes up on top of the soil. So if they start to look a little peaked, all you got to do is take a shovel full of soil and throw it right on top of them, and they'll go again. They've just grown themselves up out of the soil. They're great. So they don't mind a little soil on top of the right. No, they don't mind a little soil on top. Okay. So we'll real quickly look at some pictures. That's the pseudochorus that they come from. Uh, that's how I get them from Japan. Um, there's an orangey particular. Yeah, do you want to kill the lights real quick, I guess? Sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to go. I thought he was going to have to go out. That's better. All right, you can see again some of these color patterns with the yellow and the red on it. Um, these, they have their name on um, of the introductions of a certain year. And all of these come from a hybridizer in Japan, and I represent him in the United States. So I'm about the only place you can get these. Here's the white with the beautiful purple eyelashes to it. The white, that's okagami that was in the pot, and it's got a little bit of lavender in that white, and then that kind of a magenta eyelash pattern. Oh, a yellow one, and shows you the branching over here with the, the deep eyelash again. An early, <coughs> early white. Um, with a more rounded, a little bit more rounded signal area. Tall purple one, um, one of the best, I think. Um, and it's about maybe 50 inches tall. Very vigorous one. Uh, there's a clump of that. And that's only like a two or three year clump of, of that particular one. They have the lines the veining in them, some of them. Um, another favorite. Uh, a, a kind of a peachy kind of color with the brown kind of, it's on, the underneath is um, dark and then the top is light. I have one that's just gorgeous. The whole bottom is dark purple and the top is all just white, the tiniest little bit of, but the little bugger doesn't like to grow. It doesn't like to be transplanted. And so I can't sell it to somebody and have it die. If it would just behave a little better. I've had it for probably 10 years. And I keep moving it. And I leave it. And I move it. And it you know, it's just not a little happy grower. But it's so cool. You'd have to come to my garden to see that one. Um, there's one with more of the red and the big yellow signal, yellow with some dots and stuff. Uh, some of them, I, in the judge's training, I showed some that the petals roll back. Now, this one doesn't usually do it, but that picture it's sure doing it. Uh, that's a, another tall uh, purple. Uh, they do change color when they uh, bloom. This is when it first comes out. This is kind of the second day, and that's the third day, and it's starting to curl up and go. But you can see, if you have these different flowers on the same clump, it's pretty interesting to see the different colors. They're, they're cool. Um, this is, again, a beautiful dark purple with that nice signal. But again, it doesn't want to grow as good as it should. Yukianaji grows like a weed. Um, gorgeous thing. There, there's a two or three year clump of that. And that started out as one piece. So some of them can do a little too much growing depending on where you put them. Yari, that's the one I showed you before there, <coughs> that picture. Um, this one, a lot of the judges wouldn't like how the fall goes in like that, but in the landscape, it's really cool looking. And that one, its name means droopy purple. And again, the Irish judges would not like that one, but 
it, you can't beat it as a landscape plant. It just throws up a multitude of these stalks and the long hanging poles. You get a lot of color from that. It's, it's a really pretty, they're never going to win an award of any kind, but I like it. And that's a newer one. It's really not called Kojo anymore. The Irish people said it, but that was too close to some other name. And that's the small um, one that I grow just for the yellow foliage in my garden. And I think that, yeah, there's, there's the foliage. So those, that's the kind of colors that the Sudatas come in. That's, that's that again, Chris. <laughs> All right, anybody else have questions? Yes. Two quick questions. One on fragrance. It seemed like the ones on the table, the palest color had more fragrance. Is that true? Like most flowers are like that. If they have more color, they attract more. Nope. Uh, it varies. There's some dark purples like grape harvest. It's almost black. That the fragrance is kind of like grapes, and then it's really powerful. Some of the lighter ones, maybe. Uh, I don't think that has to do with color. It's either fragrant or it's not. And um, some of these, um, well, some of them are kind of known for their fragrance, and some, some of them can smell bad, too. <laughs> <laughs> and on the bearded, do the terminal need to be open if you're going to use them cut? And bunch showing color for them to all open? along the stalk or? Um, they'll continue to grow and open, yeah. If, if you can pick it when the terminal is open, then the others will usually continue to bloom down the stalk. But if you put it in a flower arrangement and you need a flower right there, well, <laughs> you know what? It'll be there for a day or two, but that one will die. And then this one will come out and that won't be where you want it in the arrangement. And then that one will come out and you definitely didn't want it down there, so it depends. And also on bearded irises, you do not want to set them on your grandmother's antique sideboard. They spit. They have a little sappy kind of thing that comes out and spits little drops down. And they're almost impossible to get off of your wood furniture. Beardless irises don't do that. And usually the little table irises, the miniature tall bearded, don't do that. Hmm. But these big ones, and some do and some don't, but some of them spit on your furniture. So I never put them on the buffet in the dining room. And I wouldn't put them on my best tablecloth. Right. Why do they spit? Just a, a section about that big. Yeah, just around the base. They, I, I call it, they spit, because they, there's this little, little, just looks like you spit on top of your, your buffet or something. Other questions? Yes? For the irises you can use in a water garden, how deep or how shallow is the range of water? Most of them like to be at the edge of the water, maybe a foot or less. And I didn't have any pictures of Louisiana irises in here, but Louisiana irises are great for you around here, and they'll grow up where I live too. They're not, you know, they're cold hardy for me, and they'll grow along the edge of a pond, um, in a lake, along a stream. Um, most of them usually it's an, it's you know a foot or less of water for the depth of water. Yeah, depth of water. Right. Yes. On the bearded irises, on the rhizomes, how, how many stalks would you get off of one rhizome? You'll get one stalk. Yeah. That rhizome will produce one stalk. Then on the side, you'll see the little babies starting to grow, and there'll be two, usually, or four, usually four. Sometimes they make six and eight, and they're the ones that really increase pretty quickly. Um, and then next year, that rhizome will never bloom again. That main rhizome will never bloom again. So you just break that stalk off when it's finished. But it will feed the little ones. So that one rhizome that bloomed this year, if it produced four babies, will bloom four stalks next year. And then they'll make four each, so 16 the next year. So you should not take the babies off of that mother. No, uh, you can, once they get bigger, if the babies get bigger, then you can cut off, take that mother rhizome out and throw it away. 
But you know, sometimes what I do, we do it, we have our sale and we sell the, the nice new rhizomes that have gotten kind of teenage size and we sell those and I'm left with that old mother rhizome with like nothing but maybe a little tiny bud. I plant those in a row and next year they don't bloom but the next year I have just incredible plants again. So next year that's what I'll have. I planted all those old bare rhizomes and they all grew like like gangbusters so next year I'll have these beautiful flowers again in a row and I'll have to dig them up for the iris sale. <laughs> questions? Other questions? I think, I don't know, well, I don't know how long I was supposed to talk, but I think they said an hour, but it's a little more. Anybody else? Okay. That's it. Thank you.